Act One, Scene One. The play is set in the battered living room of Betty's house in South Dublin. Her family were raised in this room. Her husband died in it and his armchair still sits pride of place. There is an old piano in the room and on top of it are old faded out birthday cards, almost a year old. One of them clearly says 79. Hanging on the wall is a cross of Bridget and a framed photograph of the Pope. The furniture in the room is very old, including a drinks cabinet in the corner and a TV set, positioned so that the audience can see the screen. There are papers, books and laundry covering all of the sofa and chairs in the room, apart from Grandad's chair. Betty is 79 years old. She grew up in Cork and never lost the accent, despite living in Dublin for most of her adult life. She is quick-witted and has a wicked sense of humour. She's sitting in the armchair beside her husband's one, reading a book titled Forensic Science for Dummies. Betty is hard of hearing but refuses to wear hearing aids. She also has a tendency to play up her inability to hear. There is a large suitcase in the corner of the room with a tag from Boston to Dublin. Enter Louisa from stage right. She's speaking on the phone. Okay, yeah, no, no, that's great. Friday's great. The sooner the better, thanks. Okay, talk then, yeah, <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks. Bye, bye. What's that about? Wi-Fi man? The wee man? The Wi-Fi man. What? Wi-Fi. I'm the one who's almost 80, but you're the one talking gibberish. So I can go online now, onto the web. Web? <sighs> Cover your mouth when you yawn, child. Sorry. Did you not sleep well? Like a brick. I'd forgotten how long the journey is. It really takes it out of you. Well, I suppose you haven't done that trip in nearly five years. No, I suppose I haven't. Have you told Maggie you're here? Um, no, not yet. I will, though. I only got in yesterday, you know, there's time. And are you going to tell me why you're here? What? Pardon? I'm home for your birthday now. Just my birthday? Yes. Long way to come, just for a day. Well, while I'm here, I thought I'd hang around for a bit, see how I like being back. I've been away a, uh, away a while, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to be here, you might make yourself useful. Louisa looks at her confused. Betty is indicating the clock with her head. Louisa isn't getting it. Four o'clock. It's four o'clock, for goodness sake, give me patience. Tea time, child. Louisa gets it and springs to action, heading for the kitchen. Betty returns to her book. Louisa pops her head into the room for after a minute. Red bush or berries? What? Red bush or berries? What kind of question is that? Right. Louisa leaves the room again. Betty checks her watch, puts down her book and turns on the TV. She seems completely abled when no one is around to do things for, for her. Louisa re-enters minutes later with two cups of tea. There you go, Nan. Ah, uh, thanks, love. It's just about to start. Louisa moves to sit in Grandad's chair. Betty sits up suddenly. Where do you think you're going? I was going to sit in the chair. You are not. He's gone only seven years and you're dying to jump into his chair. You can't just come back from the big US missy and think you're the rule of the roost. I'm sorry I'd forgotten. Hmm. Louisa looks around for a space to sit. There are newspapers and junk everywhere. She decides to commit to a place on the floor. She is clearly at home in this space, even if a bit awkward initially, due to the length of time it's been since she was there. The two of them sit and watch Agatha Christie's Poirot on TV. It is clearly a ritual and it feels homely to both of them. You would not believe the amount of people that think he's French when he's actually Belgian. Hercule Poirot, the famous detective. French! <laughs> sure there's no smart people in France. Have you ever been to France? Let me finish my tea, love, and then we'll have a dance. Louisa looks at Betty, perplexed. Betty looks down to see her watching, almost as if she heard exactly what Louisa said. Betty gives her a knowing smile. You got it wrong, by the way. What? The tea. I don't drink Red Bush after 12. <sighs> my four o'clock tea is always Barry's. And, and that's why I asked you. I you would remember something as important as what tea I take with my four o'clock Poirot. 
more pressing matters in my life than my nan's tea. My little Miss USA, would you wished so I can hear Poirot? They both sit and watch again for a while. A phone rings somewhere in the room. Louisa jumps to find it. Oh, that'll be Marjorie. Marjorie still rings. Oh, absolutely. Every day with news of some sort. Oh, Louisa, don't worry about it. I don't mind paint any mind to the gossip anyway. Louisa finds the phone under a newspaper on the sofa and passes it to Betty. After this, she moves to the TV to pause the action so Betty can hear. She smiles to herself when she hears the following. Now, Marjorie, tell me. I've been thinking of what the father said after Mass. He, no, he never. And sure, what did the others say about it? That isn't right. You know what the committee is missing? Me. I've been telling the father for years that he needs some level headiness as a chair, but he keeps offering another term to Joan. Joan, for Christ's sake. So Joan couldn't arrange a meet-up in a park, let alone a parish fair. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Marjorie. Now you'll ring me tomorrow. Oh, good, good. good. Yeah, bye now. Bye now. God bless. Bye. Bye. Like I said, she does his gossip. Dreadful woman. Put it back on for me, Louisa. Louisa presses play on Poirot and returns to her position on the floor. They sit together and watch for a few minutes. Stephanie, the wife. She's way too shady. What? The wife. She did it. If you want to be living with me, you can't be telling me who done it. I don't know. I'm just guessing. What do you think you are? A world-renowned French detective? Belgian. What? You said he was Belgian. What? You said... Honestly, child, you've lost the ability to enunciate in the big US. Louisa gives up. Both continue watching. Do you want another cuppa? No, thanks, love. Louisa takes the cup from Betty's hand and leaves for the kitchen. Betty springs to action and quickly fast-forwards the TV programme. She can see that a man is taken away in handcuffs at the end. She returns the recording to where it was when Louisa exited. Louisa re-enters at the point Betty presses play again. Louisa sits down again on the floor. Do you want to bet on it? What? The wife. No, sure isn't this one of your reruns that you've taped? I bet you've seen it a hundred times. I have not. Mm -hmm. Swear on the Pope. Oh, on the Pope. Heavy bet, Nan. Heavy bet. Okay. What are you proposing? If it's not the wife, you drive me to and pay for my chiropodist appointment tomorrow. And if it is the wife? I'll let you live with me. You're already letting me live with you. Well, aren't you lucky? Baffled, Louisa moves some papers to sit up on the sofa and lands on Betty's forensic science book. What's this about? Nan, Betty. Yes, dear? What's this book about? To lose the ability to read as well as enunciate in the big US. I knew they were stupid, but this stupid. It's a book about forensic science. Forensic. I know that, Nan. I'm asking why you have it. I'm ah, just doing a bit of research. What? Well, I've been thinking of training to do my Garda exams. What? I'm thinking of training to do my Garda exams. No, I heard you. I just don't understand how. I'm torn between that and forensic science. You know, there's loads of discounts for old people. Mature students, you mean? Mature, did you say? <laughs> sure, nobody more mature than me. And you know, the guards need a bit of fresh blood. Should the commissioner was on RTE, saying they're desperate for recruits. I'm sure they had an eight-year-old in mind. Louisa, you've picked up this awful habit in the US of mumbling. Speak um, up, girl. Never mind. Louisa's phone rings. She looks at the caller ID and blocks the call. Is it the wee man again? Uh, yeah, it's the Wi-Fi man. The phone rings again. Again, she doesn't pick it up. Betty looks at Louisa, who seems unsettled. You all right, love? Fine, then. I think it's just the jet lag. I, I might go to bed early. Uh, but we've not found out who done it yet. It's fine, Nan. I'm sure you'll tell me tomorrow. See it through. Here, I'll fast forward. 
Betty struggles to reach the TV remote, despite being perfectly able earlier. Louisa reaches over and hands it to her. She smiles at her and fast forwards to stop at the scene of the arrest. They watch for a moment and see Poirot placing handcuffs on a man. <laughs> I told you it wasn't the wife. Okay, Nan. Okay. <laughs> what time's your appointment tomorrow? They continue to watch the screen as Poirot says the wife was also involved and arrests her. What? What are you doing, Poirot, you stupid French detective? It's not the wife. They watch the TV for another moment. That mean the bet's off? Blackout. Two days later, the sitting room is a lot neater. Louisa is in the sitting room playing the piano. It's so old that the sound is very tinny and flat. As she plays, she refers to her granddad's chair. She is playing As Time Goes By from the film Casablanca. Remember this one, he used to love it. You must remember this. A kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. Your mother is driving me mad, girl. Absolutely mad. Oh, you're all right, love. I'm fine, Nan. What's going on? What? Mum. Who's mum? Mine. <laughs> you said she was driving you mad. Did I? Ah, no, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> Did you remember the Wi-Fi man is coming today? Betty sits down in her chair and picks up her forensic science book and begins to read. Louisa remains at the piano and plays a few notes. After a moment, Betty remembers what, what she wanted to speak to Louisa about. Oh, your mother? Yes, yes. She's driving me mad. She keeps asking me who I want at the party and what type of cake and what birthday games we'll play. It's my 80th birthday, for feck's sake. I'm not 11. Nan, if you don't want a party. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Louise. Of course I want a party. It's not every day you turn 80. Louisa gives up and continues playing lightly. You settling in okay? As best I can. You don't miss it? The big US? I mean, yeah, I suppose I do a bit. Strange. You coming home out of the blue like that. Just missed you, Nan. Couldn't let you turn 80 without me. <laughs> I see. When are you going to see your sisters? Yeah, I, I know. I, I really need to. I'm just not sure I'm ready to see Maggie and David. What? I'll call mom today. I know. She's not always been easy. It's not her. He's an odd one for sure. Yeah, to put it mildly. <laughs> He's not your father, Louisa. He never will be. Never. I do think somewhere behind his awkwardness and inability to hold a conversation, there's a decent man. Also, I, I think he's a little scared of your mum. <laughs> Maybe we do have something in common. Louisa continues to play the piano. Her phone begins to ring. It is on the side table beside Betty's chair. Betty sees the caller ID. Who's Taylor? What? She jumps up from the piano and runs to grab the phone. Go on. Cool. It's just a person from the States. The same person who's been calling you every day since you got back? Maybe. Maybe. It's a yes or no answer, Louisa. It's uh, complicated. Uh, I may be almost 80, but I know what it's complicated means. I'll leave it now. Isn't the mysterious tailor the reason you came home? You didn't have me fooled, girlie. It's not every day a 25-year-old gives up her life in the big U.S. to move home and live with her nan. How on earth did you know that? Oh, let's just say before your granddad I had a tailor of my own. Nan? Oh, yeah, Missy. You'd be surprised about the life I led back in Cork. Yeah, too much info, thanks. Mm hmm? Was it that obvious? Oh, please. You've been in a right sulk ever since you got back. Love sulk? Well, mood swings, not eating, fatigue. You're not pregnant, are you? Jesus, no, Nan, not at all. Oh, thank heavens for that. Do you no. want to talk about it? 
Right you are, dear. You'll be all right. Falling in love is all part and parcel of life. Do you believe in soulmates? What? Soulmates. Was Grandad your soulmate? No. Mine is Poirot. Man. I don't believe in that. There's so much love to be given. I loved your Granda. I love my children, my grandchildren. I love Agatha Christie. Different kinds of love, but still all great loves. I know. Just sometimes I feel like, oh, it's just so oh, intense. I don't know if I'll ever really recover from it. You'll learn to recover. Trust me. Betty has said this with sincere knowing. Louisa thinks about pushing her on it, but leaves it. They sit in silence for a while. What happened that he's still calling you? You do a Cinderella on him? Mm, something like that. Well, girlie. If you ever feel the time is right to talk about it, I'm a great listener. <laughs> In that you don't hear anything. Oh, you made the decision to come home, so you just got to face up to it. If it wasn't the right decision for you, you know where the airport is. Oh, no, no, Nan, I won't be going back. Did he kill someone? What? No, Jesus, Nan, no. I just... Now that I'm here, it's almost like he never existed. You know what does exist? What? The kettle. Louisa, laughing, heads to the kitchen. As she leaves, she turns. Y you only have one child. What? You said you loved your children, but you only have one. Come on, man, you're not that loopy yet. Oh, no, of course not. Only one. Louisa leaves with a laugh. Betty sits in the chair for a moment, thinking. She eventually gets up and picks up Louisa's phone. She goes into call history and dials a number. We hear the voicemail of an American accent. Hello, this is Taylor. Please leave a message and I'll get right back to you. Beep. Blackout. Four days later, the birthday party is the next day. The sitting room has been cleaned up nicely. Maggie is standing in the sitting room looking around. She's in a nurse's uniform. Louisa enters from the bedroom, looking at her phone and not seeing Maggie until she speaks. So, oh, the prodigal child returns. Maggie, Mum, oh God, sorry, I had no idea you were here. How are you? Louisa moves to Maggie to hug her. It's severely awkward. Mum told me you were here, but I didn't believe her. When did you get back? Um, I've been here about a week. Just home for the party? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was kind of a last minute thing. Could have told me you were here. Well, I know how busy you are and I didn't want you to feel... I'm sorry that I didn't call. I just didn't want to feel like you had to fit me in with David and the girls and everything. How are they? Who? The girls. Oh, fine. Growing up. And David? Yeah, he's fine too. Uh, he's outside waiting for me. So how are things in America? Oh yeah, amazing. I'm really happy there. Mm-hmm. Is there anything I can help with for tomorrow? No, no need, thanks. We've got it all under control. Are the girls coming tomorrow? Yeah, of course they are. They've got their party dresses ready. Great, I can't wait to see them. Could have seen them a week ago. You won't recognize them, Tilly in particular. She's really growing up. It's been a long time, Lou. I know. Maggie looks around for something to talk about. She checks out what's in Betty's drink cabinet. I'd better stock up. The father is coming. There'll be no alcohol left in the place when he's finished. Do you want me to help? With what? I could give you money towards the drinks. <laughs> Don't need charity. I didn't mean it like that. Well, how did you mean it? I just, I just wanted to help. Can't just saunter back in here and offer to pay for everything. Mum, Maggie, uh, I mean, I didn't mean it like that. You can do the dessert. Okay, great, thank you. How are the girls? You already asked me that. My phone connected to the Wi-Fi when I got in. Oh yeah, I got it set up a few days ago. And uh, Nan doesn't have Wi-Fi. 
I'm giving her lessons. It's mostly for me, though. There's only so much power one can take. <laughs> Rita is enjoying her joke, which Maggie clearly isn't. There's a car horn heard from outside. That's David. I'm here for some pictures. Mum wants printed for the party? Uh, yes, uh, here they are. Louisa moves to the piano and hands Maggie some old negatives that were sitting on top. She asked to get them developed, um, but I have a job interview later. A job interview? I thought you were just here for the party. Yes, no, th that I, I might stay for a while. Stay in Ireland? Yes. In your nan's house? Well, yes. You'll be a 25 year old living with your nan. Yes, I guess I will be. The car horn is heard again, this time more impatient. Maggie moves towards the front door. If I'm around, I can see the girls. I'll have to talk to David. He has a thing about Americans. I'm not American. Tell him that. The car horn rings out twice more. Well, if those are all I needed, I'll be on my way. OK. Maggie moves to leave and turns back. Any idea what the surprise is? What? The surprise Mum keeps telling about. Uh, tomorrow, she's got a surprise. Oh, no. No idea. OK. David enters from the front door at pace as Maggie turns to leave. Maggie, I need to get to work. Louisa! Oh my God! Hi! I didn't know you were here. I didn't know either. Hi David, hope you're well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I'm fine. Thanks. So, uh, how long are you home for? I'm not sure yet. Just the party. Could I see the girls while I'm here? Uh, oh, uh, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, they'd love that. Right. Well, we better get going then. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, OK, well, Louisa, uh, I guess we'll see you soon. You will. <laughs> OK, OK, great. Bye then. Bye. He exits the way he came in. Maggie begins to follow him. Maggie, it's good to see you. Mm. Maggie nods slightly in agreement and exits. Louisa flops onto the sofa, exhausted from the interaction. Mm. Betty enters after some time from the bedrooms. Is she gone? Mum, yeah, gone. Good. Betty heads to the, her armchair to sit. Oh, she's a very difficult woman. I wonder what that makes me. What? Nothing. She wasn't always, of course. Her dad pandered to her only child syndrome. Suppose. I'm going to take the girls out next week. Mum said they're really grown up. Very. Tilly thinks she's a teenager. Don't know if I could handle a teenager. They're good girls. Unfortunate parentage. <laughs> At least someone said it. How are you feeling today? Fine. Hmm. Nan, stop digging. I'm, I'm fine. Whatever you say. How was it seeing David? He's less awkward than I remember. Maybe you've just grown up a bit. Yeah, maybe. He's a good father. That has to be said about the man. Incredibly awkward, but a good father. They're a strange match, of course. She was so lonely after your dad died. She would have married anyone who asked. I was lonely too. I know you were. Louisa is surprised that Betty heard her. Betty reaches out a hand and they have a moment. So what's this surprise Mum told me about? What, dear? Mum said you have a surprise. Oh, yes. So it's not really a surprise per se. <laughs> right. Can I know in advance? I don't know why you insist on asking questions you already know the answer to. You're always up to something, Betty Mulligan, aren't you? The phone rings. This time, Louisa knows exactly where it is. She gets it and hands it to Betty. As she talks, Louisa quietly plays the piano. Thanks, love. Hiya, Marjorie. Well, yes, I am still alive. And 80 tomorrow, can you believe? Ah, I bet Joan was raging. I hope you told her the father is coming to my party. You betcha she is, he is. I sure, why wouldn't he? I'm the most valued choir member. 
absolutely, Marjorie, absolutely. So that's exactly what I thought myself. And let me tell you, it'll be a party no one forgets. Okay, Marjorie, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, and be sure to tell Joan about the father and tell me exactly what she says. Yeah, okay. Bye now. Bye, Marjorie. Bye. Bye. God bless. Bye. <laughs> Poor Joan. The father didn't go to her party. Joan doesn't strike me as the party type. What? When was Joan's party? Oh, she didn't have one. Joan isn't the type for parties. So is it time for some more wife eye insight? I know how to get onto the great wild web, but how do I swim? Surf. Come on, get the laptop. Louise opens a laptop that's been resting on top of the piano and moves to the sofa to sit beside Betty. Did you tell your mum not to look at the photos once they're printed? Oh no, I didn't. I, I didn't know. Uh, not to worry. I don't think she'll realise anyway. Realise what? Nan, what are you up to? All in good time, dear. All in good time. Okay. Are you looking forward to tomorrow? Ah, sure. It'll be grand. Nice reason to get dressed up. Do you know, I think the last time we all planned to have a celebration here was at your granddad's wake. What? No, surely not true. That was what, six? Seven years ago. Seven years. We're big on family events at the Mulligans. Do you know what my name was before I married, married your granda? No, what? Love. Love? That's great. Betty Love. Oh, it's a good name, all right. I always wanted to keep it, but I had to take your granda's. Mulligan. Very average. Sure, there's a mulligan in every town in Ireland. They were a bit incestual, the mulligans. If I wanted to find out any more about my loves in Ireland, how, how do we swim Sir, for that? Particularly loves in Cork. OK, let's have a look. I think if we do a basic search, something will probably come up on the Ancestry website, something along the lines. OK, love and the area will be South Dublin. OK, yeah, here we go. It's a whole bunch of loves. Show me. No, Nan, remember, it's up and down. Use this. OK. Betty begins scrolling. Louisa's phone rings. She sees the caller ID and is about to cancel the call. Louisa, don't you think you'd feel better if you talk to him? Louisa thinks about it for a moment, but lets the call ring out. I'm not ready now. Tea? <laughs> Louisa exits for the kitchen. Betty continues scrolling. At times, she tries to do something on the laptop and it doesn't do what she wants. She speaks to it, open or go down. This continues for a few minutes until she stops suddenly. Whatever she is looking at has shocked her. Blackout. Later that same day, David is pacing in the living room, clearly very awkward. His two daughters sit on the sofa. Louisa enters from the bedrooms in her pyjamas. She gets a fright as Tilly and Laura, her younger half-sisters, aged eight and ten, run and, run and jump on her, crying out, Louisa. Louisa stumbles to the floor. They all embrace and giggle. David stands and watches them. He smiles. There are various let me see you and how are yous spurted out between the three of them, giggles and hugs also. What are you guys doing here? Your mum's on the night shift and the girls were way too excited when I told them you were here. So I brought them over as soon as she left. I hope that's okay. David, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Louisa bends down again to chat and giggle with the girls. Blackout. The next day, Betty's 80th birthday party. Maggie is dressed in her idea of a party dress, which is very plain and black. She has her two younger daughters with her. They are helping her put the newly printed photographs up around the room, sticking them to the walls using a stepladder. Louisa keeps entering and exiting with food and drinks, setting them up on side tables. There is a small gathering of presents on the floor by the piano. Opened cards are placed on display on top of it. The year old ones are no longer there. David is trying to find his place in the room, hovering around with a beer in his hand. Do you need any help? I can manage, thank you. Did you get a trifle? I actually made a trifle. Oh, great. Above and beyond, as usual. I wanted to do something special. 
Maggie finishes pinning the pictures to the wall and Louisa moves to help her off the stepladder. Thank you. Betty enters the room from the bedrooms. She's wearing what looks like a princess dress-up costume. Happy birthday, Nan. The dress looks really good on you. Louisa hugs Betty. Betty holds the hug longer than would be usual for them. Maggie moves in for a hug too. Mum, don't you look young? What? You look great. She never looked as good as me, Missy. You should be praying you'll look like this when you're my age. Louisa, you have a say. Yeah, of course. Want a whiskey? This early for drinking, isn't it? If you came round more, you'd know that I always have a whiskey before four o'clock and a martini after. The father's still coming. Louise, did you put up the statue? Louise indicates to a serving table which has a miniature figurine of the Virgin Mary in the middle of it. David, in his awkwardness, has perched himself on Grandad's chair. Betty squeezes Louise's hand. Good girl. Right. Maggie, tell your husband to remove his backside from that chair or he won't have a backside when he leaves. Maggie addressed David and then goes to the drinks cabinet to get Betty a whiskey. David, Mum wants you out of that chair. David moves quickly off the chair into the area, area his daughters are in. Louisa, I wanted to oh, say... Oh, no, it's okay. You don't have to say anything. Actually, I wanted to say thank you. For what? For yesterday, for listening. I genuinely feel so much better. Oh, good, good. I'm, I'm glad. But there's something I, I really wanted to... Here you go, Mum. Ah, thank you, love. You okay, Nan? Hmm? You feeling all right? Fine, fine. Better go make sure the ham's cooking nicely. But want me to? Would you wish? That kitchen is mine and mine alone. Betty exits towards the kitchen, leaving Maggie and Louisa alone. They're both struggling to find a topic of conversation. Louisa watches David with her sisters. He's great with them. Yeah, he is. Uh, I was thinking of visiting Dad's grave this week, if you wanted to join me. Maggie thinks for a moment. David does something funny that makes the girls shriek with pleasure. Maggie sees Louisa looking on with longing and loss. I'm free Thursday. How was the job interview? Ah, uh, no good. Turns out living in Boston only gives one a slightly different work ethic to hear. I think I was a bit much for them. I suggested to the manager a more effective way of doing the roster and she had to remind me I was only applying for a waiting job. What was it for? TGI Fridays. <laughs> David starts to move towards Maggie and Louisa. Louisa moves away and goes down to the girls. She brings them to the piano and they sit around and play quietly. Betty returns from the kitchen and approaches David. David, I've been meaning to say to you, I heard Tilly isn't at Rold at St Bridget's. I hope you have an explanation for that. I'm well, sure the father will ask. Well, uh, we weren't sure. Uh... Well, just something to think about, David. Maggie is watching, smirking to herself. She almost enjoys David's discomfort at these events. Betty can read the look on her face and begins to walk over to her. Enjoying yourself? Maybe just a little. You do torture him. I would leave him alone if he wasn't so damn dark, or he does it to himself. I'm trying to encourage him to be well. He'll never be Tom. No. Maggie looks towards Louisa and the girls playing at the piano. So you really going to let her stay? Who? Louisa. Why, what would you have me do? Kick her out? I don't know. Do you have any idea why she's back? No. I don't think it's good for her that you're putting her up. She can't just come home after years and take shelter here. She's not a child. She doesn't need to be. This isn't her home. She thinks it is. Well, it's not. Why does it bother you so much? It doesn't. We've been through a lot in this house. You both practically moved in when... I think she feels safe here. You, of all people, should know there's very little one wouldn't do to feel safe. And just what's that supposed to mean? What? You do that on purpose. I don't know what you're talking about. 
Give Louisa a chance. She's been through a lot. Betty begins to move away from Maggie. She's very like him. Tom. I know. David walks towards Maggie, flustered. You'd think she was serious. Who? Your mum. About me having to talk to the father. <laughs> well, I certainly don't want to do it. she even find out? She asked me when Tilly was starting at St. Bridget's and I said I didn't think she'd Just be Just something there. we both agreed was best for her. So what's yes. the plan? I stand with the father and make up some elaborate story about why Tilly won't be going to the Catholic school. Because something tells me we don't believe in God won't cut it. No, nope, definitely not ideal. Why can't you do it? You know, you've known him much longer. I did warn you that my mum wouldn't be happy and we also agreed that it would be you who deal with her. I can just about handle Betty, but the father as well. Maybe I could pull a sickie and sneak out before he arrives. You will not. You're here now, so you're just gonna have to man up and deal with it. Well, you know what I'm like. In my attempt to tell him we purposefully didn't enroll her, I'll end up baptised and laden half my wages. Oh, I would strongly advise against that. Oh, come on, Mag. Can't you do it? What is wrong with you? Why can't you just come to one family event and be civil? You know I hate these things. I, I don't understand why. I just don't like standing in a room of people I don't know and playing the game of life. What? You know, who earns the most? Who's got the biggest house? Who's going to Lake Garda for Christmas? I just can't stand it. Oh, do your best to make an effort, David. It's my family. I make an effort with yours. Like when? I take the girls to your sister every week. Because she babysits them. I stay to have a coffee with her. Because she's got a coffee machine. I make an effort, David. Okay. Well, maybe I would make an effort if your family were. I'd tread very carefully, David. Warmer. Did it ever cross your mind that it might be you that's not the warm one? What does that mean? Just saying. The problem may not be them. Okay, like what? Like what what? Give me examples of when I could have been warmer. Dave. No, seriously. Come on. I think I've always gone above and beyond to fit in here. Let's not do this now. I'm not doing anything. I just don't understand why you find it so hard to be normal around them. I'm always. I mean, actually make an effort to talk. Well, I was talking to Louisa for a bit. <sighs> Louisa is different. In what way? She just is, and you know it. So you're angry with me for not talking to your family, even though I was talking to Louisa, which apparently doesn't count? Maybe there's no point in me even trying to make an effort. You're always looking for a way out. If that were true, I'd have walked out the door years ago. <laughs> I have actually been really trying with Louisa. I know. The girls told me. Oh. You could have waited for me. Oh. I'm sorry we didn't. I didn't think. It's fine. The girls were just so excited. And I didn't know if you'd want to come. I said it's fine. Is it though? I knew we should have waited. I just find it weird that you're seeing her without me. Why? I don't know. It's just weird, okay? I know things between you aren't great. And things between me and her aren't, weren't exactly easy, but I don't know. Something about this time feels different. I really want her to know I'm making an effort with her. Maybe when I tried before, she wasn't ready, but I'm hoping this time she'll see it. When did you try before? What? When? Huh, you know when. Oh. Do you think maybe she just wasn't ready then? Maybe. It almost felt normal last night. That's nice. I just wish it could have been like that when the girls were younger. What, when she was in boarding school? You hardly saw her. No. I suppose we didn't. She hated school and still chose not to come home on weekends. Don't think we ever stood a chance. She hated school? Hmm? I thought she loved it. 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it wasn't an easy time for her. No, of course it wasn't. But you always told me she was happy there. Okay, maybe she was. It was a while ago now. If she wasn't happy, why didn't she come home on weekends? I don't know, David. Maybe I remembered it wrong. That's very unlike you. What do you want me to say? She didn't want to spend her weekends with you? She disliked me that much? No, I, I don't know. I could... I had no idea. I was just saying, I don't remember specifics. I... Oh... I had no idea she hated me that much. I always thought it weird how much she stayed away. It's fine. Like you said, making up for it now. Uh, maybe I should talk to her about it. No, I don't think that's... Um... I think that's probably for the best, though, no? Maybe if I just talk to her. I really don't think that's necessary, David. It may help fix things. Now doesn't seem the right time. No, I'm going to do it now. We've got to work this out. David begins to walk towards Louisa, but Maggie grabs his arm. David! David stops immediately, shaken at Maggie's outburst. I, uh, I, I don't really think it's a party appropriate conversation. Why did you react like that? Just told you. Tell me something, Maggie. When Louisa left, you told me I was the reason, right? That's right. And when she didn't come home the first Christmas, or the Christmas after that, or any other Christmas, you told me it was because of me. That's what she said, David. Did she ever say why? If she really didn't like me that much, she could have just stayed at your mum's. What do you want me to say? I want you to tell me why I can't talk to Louisa. Of course you can talk to her. About what happened when Till was born. About the adoption. David, be quiet. No. No way. David. You never told her, did you? Please, David, this isn't the time. Did you? Did you tell her? You are unbelievable. You never told her, did you? Did you? Christ's sake, Maggie, say something. David, listen to me. I want you to calm down. Remember where you are and lower your voice. I'm racking my brain here and it all fits. I'm beginning to think you've been using me as a scapegoat. Don't be ridiculous, David. Then tell me the truth. The truth is, we all eventually become the bad guy, even when we don't deserve to be. We can talk about this later. Maggie walks away from David and over to her daughter by the piano. David is left awkwardly standing alone, crippled by the conversation and confusion. Nan! Nan! Betty turns towards the piano. Louisa, I really need to... Come listen and see what the girls have learned for you. Louisa sits beside the young girls as they slowly bang out Happy Birthday on the piano. Betty, David and Maggie give them a, a big applause at the end of it. Oh, well done, girls. What did you want to say, Nan? Betty is aware that David and Maggie are listening. What, dear? You? you said you had something you wanted to say. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I wonder, girls, why don't you go to the kitchen for a while? There's some treats in the fridge. The girls look at David to check it's okay and he nods. They exit towards the kitchen. Well, family, I was going to do this when everyone arrived, but perhaps a more intimate setting is best. Betty has positioned herself in front of a photograph attached to the wall. In the photograph is a young woman holding a baby. She beckons everyone to gather around. First, I want to thank you for being here today. 80 years on this planet, there's a thought. Mind you, I don't feel it at all. Maggie, it's wonderful to have you and your children here. Thank you for coming and for your help with the party. I also have to say a special welcome to our Louise and also my thanks. In the past few days, she's been my companion and confidant and at times I hers. Lou, I want you to know be it a week or forever, you will always be welcome here. Of course, it's strange coming back to Ireland, I'm sure. Things must have changed. I'll tell you this for nothing. The Ireland we are standing in feels like a different planet to the one I was born in. The world I grew up in. 
I would never wish it upon anyone. Yes, I'm sure there are things that'll be different. Maybe makes one question, where is home? Betty looks at Louisa and gives her a smile. Louisa isn't sure how to respond, so she remains silent. Well, I've spent most of my life in Dublin, as you knew. As you know, I, I grew up in Lovely Cove. Never lost the accent, mind. You can take the girl out of Cork, eh? Oh, before I forget, with the father coming later, I want you all to be on your best behaviour. I know you might think it odd I invited him, but it was very normal to have the priest around when I was younger. Dad would invite our father to tea every Sunday. Father O'Brien. He was a very good father. Very by the book. And in our house, what Father O'Brien said was the law. Did Louisa tell you she's been teaching me how to use the internet? I figured why not learn some new skills? I'm only 80 after all. We had a goggle into my past. Did I say that right? Google. Right. So anyway, as we goggled, I had Louisa look up loves in Cork. That's the name I was born with, David, in case you didn't know. It's a pretty name, that shame I couldn't keep it. Anyway, as we goggled, we found lists of loves, a whole bunch of loves in Cork and some even in Cove. Where was I? That's uh, so something about loves in Cove. Right. Right, Maggie. My dear Maggie. We may not always see eye to eye, you and me. Your da always said we were too similar. Life has thrown you more than your fair share of blows. One of my greatest regrets is that you didn't have a sibling to help you through it. Did you know this is the first time we've actually planned to be together since your da's passed? Seven years, isn't that a thought? Time just shoots by and we don't realise until it's too late. I need to tell you all something. Something that I should have shared years ago. Something about getting old that makes you regret letting life slip by. Does anyone recognise the young woman in the photo behind me? Maggie, I thought you might have when you got them developed. We look, but we do not see. Who said that? <laughs> Probably Poirot. I'll goggle it later. Any guesses who this young woman is? Hmm? No? It's me. That's me, age 17. Betty points to the photo. Who's the baby? What? Who is the baby? Oh, I'm glad you asked, David. The baby is my son. Mum, I, I was born years after that photo was taken. Oh, no, no, oh, no, this isn't you. As I said, the baby is my son. Maggie turns to look at the photo. This is baby Sean. Betty turns back to her family and sees their confused look. She smiles. Well... I've waited a long time to say his name out loud. Baby Sean. He was born on my 17th birthday. Today he is 63 years old. What? I got pregnant when I was 16. No ring on my finger. Shocking, I know. And back then, totally unacceptable. It was a fling, of course. I knew he was married. But I did love him. I used to help out on their farm. Oh, what we'd get up to when his wife went into town. Mom, the inevitable happened. I only managed to keep it a secret for a month. And then, as usual, on a Sunday, Dad would have Father O'Brien over. Only this time, when he left at the end of the meal, he took me with him. Have you heard of a Magdalene laundry? I spent my days scrubbing and cleaning and growing Sean. Imagine giving birth on your birthday. I always thought it was so poetic. He was perfect. 
beautiful. He didn't even cry, just popped out and into my arms. So happy. He knew he was where he was meant to be. Only, of course, there were other plans made on our behalf. I know this must all seem like nonsense. I, I don't know if I'm saying any of it right. I've waited an extraordinarily long time to tell you. They took him from me. He was adopted and I got to leave the laundry. Da said I could come home, but I never did. I got on a bus and came up to Dublin. I met your da a few years later. Mom. I never told him. I always wished I had. Betty gets a bit emotional. Louisa jumps up and helps her to her usual seat. When, when we were searching for loves in Cork, I found a Sean Love. I don't know if it's him, of course, but I've spent 63 years missing him. I'm not going to spend any more. I'm going to look for him, and I guess I just wanted you to know. We all have our differences, what family doesn't, eh? But I do hope you'll stand by me on this. It's the only thing I want. And The doorbell rings. No one moves. It rings again. Should I get that? Oh, I'm worn out. Maybe we should cancel. The doorbell rings again. Oh, I just need to rest. Still no one moves. They are all speechless. Suddenly the door from the hallway burst open. Tilly and Laura run into the room, followed by a young man. Tilly says, Lou, there's a man here for you. Louise's look of confusion turns to shock when he has fully entered the room and they lock eyes. What? Oh, God. Taylor. Blackout. That's the end of Act One. So we'll be taking a 10 minute break here. We'll be back at three minutes past eight for the second act. Thank you very much.
Act two. Ten years previous to Act One, Maggie and David are sitting in the living room, both looking much younger, brighter. Maggie is heavily pregnant. There are suitcases in the room and Grandad's chair is lived in. His cardigan is on the chair. There is music open on the piano. It's important that it appears he is still alive to indicate the action is in the past. So you think that's the lot? Yeah, should be everything. Are we going to bring Lou's lamp? I really want her to feel at home. Yeah, good idea. Thank you, David. For what? For being so good with her. I don't know how she's going to take living with a man who isn't Tom. Are you nervous? Not nervous, just concerned she isn't ready, perhaps. She asked me if she could stay with Mum. Oh, I didn't realise. Is it because of me? No, I, I think it's that she feels safe here, you know. It's home. I will do everything I can to make ours feel like home for her. I know you will. I really want to get this right. I want us to be a family. Maggie smiles as David comes close to her, rubs her belly, kisses her. I've been thinking, with the baby coming and you moving in, I don't want to isolate her. She's young. She'll be okay. No, I know. You've both been incredible, considering what you've been through. But I know you've told me some stuff about how you felt with her and Tom. Yeah. Hey, you okay? Yeah, yeah, just thinking how different this pregnancy is to my first one. I was so excited to have a little girl. Tom and I found out, but didn't tell anyone. Had I told you that? No. Oh, baby brain. I sometimes forget I've lived this whole other life before you. Do you think I'm a good mum? What? Of course I do. You don't just have to say that. I'm not. Babe, what you and Louisa have been through is unimaginable. And you're doing the best you can. Some days she doesn't even talk to me. She's a teenager. That's pretty normal, I believe. And you don't think we're moving too fast? Uh, Maggie, like it or not, baby is coming in a month. No, I meant for her. I just worry that this is all too soon for her. I mean, he was everything to her. I'm never going to try and take his place. No, I, I know. And, and I've told her that too. It's, it, she just needs some time. When we're living together and she's a big sister, I'm sure things will get better. <sighs> things aren't as bad as you think they are. You're a great mother, Maggie. When I was pregnant with Lou, I promised myself that I was going to be the cool mum that everybody wished they'd had, you know. I was going to go to ballet with her and painting classes, and dress her in pink with little bows. And it's so funny because Tom really wanted a boy. Every day I'd come home with something new for the baby and he'd say something like, I'm going to be so outnumbered. <laughs> That'll be me with you three. Mm, yeah, I suppose it will. Only when she arrived, it was clear. Tom was all that mattered to her. Maggie, you matter to her. I don't even come close. They were inseparable. They cook together, read the same books, sing to the radio every morning when I was in bed trying to sleep off a night shift. <laughs> even became a leader in the scouts so he could join her for weekend trips. <laughs> they did everything together, everything. <laughs> Imagine feeling left out in your own house. I can't made me constantly doubt the way I am with her. I used to question whether they'd even notice if I just didn't come home one day. Maggie, you matter to her more than you realise. She wouldn't have got through this without you. I haven't helped her through anything. Sometimes I feel like I only made it worse. When I told her about the crash, she didn't even cry. She just sat there, staring at me. Like she hated me. Like she wished it... Maggie, don't even finish that sentence. No. No, I won't. Sorry. David ushers Maggie to sit down. All of that's behind you now. You get to start over again. A new home and a new baby. It's perfect. They embrace and sit there for a while. Maggie, I've been thinking about it for a while and I want to ask you something. Okay. I want Louisa to know that I love her. 
like a daughter and think of her as my own. After everything she's been through, I really want her to feel safe with me, you know? I think so. I just, I don't want her to feel isolated like you did. And I think with the baby coming, there's a danger that she'll feel left behind. So I was wondering, how would you feel about me adopting her? You want to adopt her? Yes. I know that it probably feels a bit sudden, but I was mainly thinking of what would happen to her if something happened to you. And I realized I'd want her to be able to stay with her sister. And I think the best way of making that happen, legally speaking, is for me to adopt her. But obviously it would depend upon what you both thought about it. I don't know, David. I never want her to feel left out of our family, Maggie. Maggie sits rubbing her bump for a while, thinking. I have a chance to get it right this time. So, can I talk to her about it? Let me. I think it's a really wonderful idea. I'll talk to her. David is ecstatic. He kisses Maggie on the forehead. Blackout. The sitting room, the day before the party. Louisa is vacuuming, preparing the room for guests. Betty enters from the kitchen looking for her book. She tries to talk to Louisa over the vacuum, but she can't be heard. Louisa is humming to herself. Louisa! Louisa! Louisa continues to vacuum. Betty walks to the plug in the wall and pulls it out so the vacuum stops. Louisa takes a while to realise as she has her headphones in. For Christ's sake, Louisa! Oh, Nan, hi. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Well, they say my hearing's bad. Sorry, sorry. Can I get you a cuppa? Can't hear and ask stupid questions. Ouch. Louisa exits to the kitchen and Betty sits down. As she does, she sits awkwardly and pulls out her book from under her. Oh, there you are. Betty begins to read while Louisa returns with the teas. How's the studying going, Nan? Hmm? The studying? What about it? How's it going? Oh, going very well, thanks. I'm on a chapter about DNA testing. Cool. It's really amazing the stuff they can do now. Yeah. Like, here, look at this. Did you know that you can get paternity testing for an unborn baby from as early as nine weeks? Louisa spills some tea as she pours. Mind yourself, child. Sorry, Nan, no, sorry. Louisa cleans up in haste. Isn't that amazing, though? Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, amazing. I mean, nine weeks, it's, it's really only a bean. Mm -hmm. Louisa sits down with her tea. What's that about? What? That face. I'm not. You don't want kids. It's, it's not that. What? It's not that I don't want kids. So there was a face? No. I don't blame you. Oh, come on. You know how difficult your mum is. Imagine her as a teen. I do want kids, Nan. Did Taylor not? What? Did Taylor? No, no, Nan, it's not like that at all. Louisa stands up and begins to clear away the teapot before she's even started to drink. Louisa. Just leave it, Nan. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just please don't talk about Taylor. You're going to have to talk about it, Lou. I don't want to. I really think you should, love. Why, Nan? Why does it bother you so much that I don't want to talk about it? It doesn't bother me. Then just leave it. I can see you're holding something back. You don't know what you're talking about. Don't I? No. I've been watching you, Lou. The sulking, the not eating. I've not been sulking. You being here is sign enough that something's wrong. I just needed to be at home, okay? I wanted to be here for your birthday. Well, you're only fooling yourself. I'm not fooling anyone, that's the truth. Lou, look at me. Look at me. Whatever it was, you can tell me. There's nothing. And trust me, sweetheart. You'll feel much better. Oh, my God. We just leave it already. What are you so afraid of, huh? I'm not afraid of anything because there's nothing wrong. Holding things in isn't healthy. Isn't that what this family does? No one talks about how they're feeling. That's different. Is it? And look who's talking. You've got some big surprise tomorrow and you're not telling us about it's not really a surprise. Okay, fine, whatever it is. I'm just making a point, Nan, that we keep things from each other. That's what we do, so don't go preaching. What you say? 
I don't want to talk about Taylor or anything else that happened, okay? Okay. Louisa flops onto the sofa. I can go first. What? I was going to tell you tomorrow, but I guess if they tell you now, you might feel more comfortable sharing. Why? Why are you so desperate to know what happened? I'm trying to help. No, you can't. No one can. What's done is done. Well, I don't see why we can't just get over it. Well, we're not going over it. We haven't even started. You don't understand. She begins to lightly cry. Lou, no matter what happens, you can tell me. I'm right here. When you were pregnant with Maggie, did you feel ready for it? Ready to be a mum? Yeah. I suppose so. Your granddad always wanted kids, forever wished we'd had more. Well, imagine you hadn't been ready. Imagine you didn't know who you were and your entire life was just about having fun and avoiding responsibilities and trying to heal from broken childhood. I'd imagine I'd have been terrified. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Do you think that had you not been ready, you might have, I don't know, not had the baby? I'm not sure I know. Terminated. Oh, well, I don't know. The Bible is very clear on that, of course, and it wasn't an option when I was pregnant. But I think if I knew bringing a child into the world wasn't going to be easy, I'd have considered it, yes. For the sake of the child. I... I got pregnant, Nan. I got pregnant and I didn't tell him. Oh, Louisa. I couldn't tell him. His family are really religious and I knew that if I told him, it wouldn't have been an option, which was a problem for me from the second I took the test. I knew I just couldn't keep it. I don't think I'm capable of motherly love. Not yet, anyway. My own mum struggles to have conversations with me. What would have I been like with a baby? Betty moves closer to Louisa and squeezes her hand. I went to this clinic and got an appointment. I told Taylor I was away for work for the night. He didn't even question it. I was working in the office now and there never would have been any need for me to be away for the night, but he just trusted me so much. What happened, sweetheart? I, I went to my appointment. There was a nurse there, she was nice, kept asking me all these questions and then she asked if there was anyone I wanted to call. I told her that I'd like to talk to my dad and she said that if I gave him, gave her his number that she'd call him. How pathetic is that? Oh, it's not pathetic. I didn't have the heart to tell her, I just made up some lavish story about him being in a different time zone. I don't know. So... You went through with it. I had to, Nan. I couldn't. I don't think I ever had a choice. So yes, I went through with it. I thought it would hurt much more than it did. And when it was finished, the nurse came back to say goodbye and asked me about Ireland. Her family were Irish. She thought we might be related and started mispronouncing all the names of all the places she knew. And I just realized in the pit of my stomach that I was mourning something. I don't know if it was what I had just done or if it was the end of my relationship or maybe my time over there. But being here with you, I needed to be here. I'm so glad you came. Me too. What happened with Taylor? Oh, that's what I'm most ashamed of. I, I couldn't face him. I went back to our place and told him we were over, no explanation, and straight to the airport. I haven't seen him since. No. I know. I know what you're thinking. How could you have done that to him? I know I made the right decision in not having it, but telling him the truth, that would have crushed me. There's no way I could have told him. He is amazing. I could tell him everything, Nan. I could talk to him about Dad and Maggie and David. We'd laugh until we cried. He just got me and what I did to him. I'd much rather he remembers our relationship as it was. They're nice memories. Do you hate me now? Betty pulls Louisa into her for a hug. Never! Would you have done the same thing? I 
think had the choice been there for me to make, I would have seriously considered it. Oh, I'd have a Maggie. Oh, no, oh dear. Hypothetical. Louisa closes her eyes for a moment, exhausted by what she just revealed. Betty strokes her hair. Uh, what were you going to tell me? Hmm? You were going to tell me something. Tomorrow, my love. I'll tell you tomorrow. What would you say to Taylor if you ever saw him again? Oh, God. I hope I never have to. I don't know how I'd face him. Blackout. The playing space is exactly the same as it was for Act 1, Scene 5. Betty is still sitting in her chair. Taylor is by the entrance. Louisa is staring at him. The two young girls are by David's side. Maggie is bewildered. Taylor! Lou? What the hell are you doing here? I'm, I'm sorry, who are you? This is Taylor. Nan, you knew about this! You invited me. What? I'm so sorry, Louise. I, I didn't to find think... you. I did the rest myself. What? Louisa, are you okay? No, what the hell is going on here? I was going to ask the same thing. Lou? No, no, don't come near me. What the hell is this? You have no right to be here. Louisa. And you? What are you thinking? I know. I trusted you, Nan, and this is just, you are unbelievable. I know. I, I was trying to tell you earlier. That's what you're trying to tell me. When did you two talk? Um. God damn it, tell me. Over a week ago. A week ago? You got to be fucking joking me. Okay, Louisa, I think that's enough. Get me out of this, David. This is between family, okay? David is clearly hurt by this. He looks to Maggie for support, but she doesn't give it. I think you better go. Maggie. Take the girls with you. For a moment, David considers challenging her, but decides to relent. He gathers Tilly and Laura and leaves. Louisa, please, can we just talk? No, if I wanted to talk, I would have picked up the phone one of the thousand times that you called me. I didn't think that you would- No, clearly. I can't believe you, sauntering in like this. What did you think, I'd just fall into your arms? Well, no, I- I don't even want to hear it. And I can't believe this from you, I- She storms out of the room towards the bedroom. Both Maggie and Taylor make a move towards her. Let her go. They both listen to Betty, and the three of them being left in the room should feel incredibly awkward. Taylor, did you say your name was? Yes. Hi. Hello. I'm Maggie. Louisa's... Mum. Yeah. And this is Betty, but I gather you've already met. She left me a voicemail. How are you, Betty? Well... <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, Taylor, I'm not sure what your relationship is to Louisa, but she seemed very upset to see you, and I think it's probably best you leave. Oh, okay, yeah, um, if that's what you want. We've just had a bit of shocking news, you see, and we're all trying to process it. I'm... I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. I wouldn't have... I'm really sorry to have bothered you like this. You weren't to know. None of us were. Look, I'm staying at the Park Hotel. Would you mind telling Lou? I'd really like to talk to her. When she's ready, of course. I'll let her know. Thank you. Well, goodbye then. Goodbye. Taylor moves for the exit towards the front door. It was nice to meet you. I'm sorry it wasn't. I'll be seeing you. Mum. Don't, Maggie, please. Where do I start? A brother. I have a brother? Yes. W why did you never tell us? I just didn't know how. Bloody hell, Mum. Why not just take it to the grave? I really thought I would. I just can't get my head around it. A brother. And you never told Dad? Hmm? Dad! No, no, never told him. Why, though? And why 
you now? Honestly, I, I, I don't know. I think I decided when Louisa showed up that uh, she's been so lost and I just, it made me wonder about him. What if he's been like that his whole life? Not knowing why his ma'am let him go. Why did you? I think I had a choice. Oh no, no, there was no choice. You go into a place like that and there's only one way of coming out and that's by doing what you're told. So, now what? Well, like I said, I'm going to try and find him. And I suppose you'd like my help? Ah, find, I'll find a way without it, but I would like your blessing as it were. Mum, I'm not going to stop you looking for him. Of course not. I do worry about what it means for us as a family, but we'll figure it out, I suppose. He might not want anything to do with us. Are you prepared for that? Betty's eyes have closed and she appears to be sleeping. I'll cancel the guests. You rest. Maggie slowly gets up from the sofa and leaves. A few minutes later, Louise enters from the bedroom. She sees that Betty is sleeping, but decides to wake her up. Nan. Nan. Yes, dear? Has Taylor gone? Taylor? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, good. She turns to exit towards the bedrooms again. Louisa. She stops. Louisa, I, I know I shouldn't have done that. I contacted him before I knew, before last night, and, and by then it was too late. I panicked. I didn't know if I should tell you or not. And then I got caught up when I told you about Sean, that it just totally slipped my mind and until he was in the room. It's fine, ma'am. And when I saw your face, I knew, I just knew I'd been so stupid to do that to you after you were so brave to talk to me about what happened. I said it was fine. Louisa. Louisa exits. Betty is left alone on the sofa. Blackout. The next day, Betty is alone in the living room, which is set up just like it was for the party. Nothing has been moved or cleared. No one has been in the room. She is back reading her forensic science book when her phone rings. She looks around for it and eventually finds it under the cushion she is sitting on. Oh, hello. Oh, hi, Marjorie. Yeah, yeah, I know. Didn't feel up to the party in the end. She called you to say, yeah? Good, good. Now, Marjorie, I've got something to tell you. Oh, you heard. Who told you? Joan. Of course she did. No, no, no idea how she knew. What? She was only yesterday. She moves fast, doesn't she? Ah, sure, I expect nothing less from her. No, what though, Marjorie? I never wanted to be on the committee anyway. Oh, no, not really. Should you know what these things are like? The trouble and effort you put into them and no one is ever really appreciated. Should just look at poor Joan. I bet she is now she knows my little secret. I bet she is. She'll look, Marjorie. It's all the same, really. Oh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> there were hundreds of us. It was terrible, wasn't it? A different world, Marjorie, a different world. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Marjorie. Oh, and come here. Thanks for the prezi. You know, I love Martini. Oh, Grant. So, thanks, Marjorie. Take care of yourself. Bye now. God bless. Bye now. Bye. Bye. As Betty puts down the phone, Louisa enters from the bedroom. They are both waiting for the other to speak first. Nan. Sorry, love. You go. Louisa, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Can you just tell me why you did it? Honestly, love, I thought I was helping. It was before you told me what happened and I could see it in you. I knew something was wrong or you were missing closure. Something wasn't right. The way he kept on ringing, I thought I was helping. And when I told you what happened, why didn't you tell me? Well, I wish I had. By that time, I, I assumed he was already on a plane and I thought, well, Betty Mulligan, you're in too deep now. Got to face the music. I know I should have told you, love. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. 
Louisa lingers by the bedroom entrance where she's been this entire time. I knew at some point he'd catch up with me. Who was I kidding? Disappearing like that and thinking it would all just go away. I'm not mad at you now. I kind of get why you did it. I think. I just wish that you told me. I know, love, me too. I felt so unprepared when I saw him. It was like someone had shot me. I, I didn't know how to react, not to mention what you told us. God, it's a mess. I'm so stupid. What was I thinking? Louisa moves to sit on the sofa beside her now. I know things are bad when you apologise sincerely. <laughs> no, I, I really am sorry. I know, I know. Louisa gives Betty's hand a squeeze. Was I rude, really rude to David? What, love? I think I was pretty tough on David. Ah. I was, wasn't I? I think it's your ma'am who's most upset with. I really didn't mean it, Nan. And we've actually been getting on quite well. You'll be fine. I should apologise, shouldn't I? Oh, you've got enough to think about. Don't worry about David. Okay. So what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. You've got Sean. I've got Taylor. He wanted you to know. He's staying at the park. You don't have to see him, though. I can ring him and explain that it's my fault. No, no, no. You don't need to do that. I was lying in bed last night and I couldn't sleep kept thinking how I would have felt if Taylor had just disappeared on me like that. I think I should talk to him. I think that would be very brave. Might see if he's free later. Louisa takes out her phone and sits there looking at it. Don't live with regret in your heart, sweetheart. It eats you up. Betty reaches out for her hand. Louisa smiles and squeezes Betty's hand. Is it okay if he comes here? Of course. That way, if it's a total disaster, you can pretend to be senile, come in naked and scare him off. Would there be no pretending? Louisa texts Taylor from her phone. So, what are we going to do about Sean? Mm -hmm. I guess I should ask you how you feel now that you've told us. About Sean? Yeah. I really don't know. Well, it, it was nice to say his name. I've been scared for years to say it out loud. I guess I'm relieved. And you still want to find him? Oh, yes. Well, I did a bit of research for you. On the web? Well, no, I couldn't find anything there. But I've got some numbers to call adoption agencies and the record office. Oh, that's great. I really want to do this for you, Nan. And for him, I want to help. Thank you, Louisa. Louisa's phone alert bings. She has got a text. Ugh. He's going to meet me later. Oh, God. You don't have to see him. <sighs> no, no. You're right. I need to do this. Tea? Do you need to ask? Louisa gets up and moves to the door. You know, I just wanted to do the same. What? You wanted to help. Man. You rang every single day. I think I'll, you'll feel better when you talk to him. Some things are better left unsaid. After 60 years of keeping my secret, believe me when I say that's not true. Louisa acknowledges what she said and leaves to the kitchen. Blackout. Later that same day, Taylor is sitting on the sofa looking at the forensic science book. Louisa enters with a tray of tea. What's this about? It's Nan's. Better not to ask. Louisa sits beside Taylor and they drink for a moment. Thanks for coming. I wanted to talk to you when things were a little bit less chaotic. I was really surprised to see you yesterday. And I definitely didn't act in the best way. It was just all a bit overwhelming. I get it. No, you can't. I do, Lou. I couldn't sleep last night, I felt so stupid. You didn't ask to see me and I just showed up, unannounced. Betty said you'd be happy to see me and I pictured this fairy tale moment of open arms and hugs and- Those airport reunions are only real on TV. Yes. Hmm. So it would seem. I always pictured meeting you again in New York, an affair to remember style. So you did 
picture seeing me again? Um, I guess I did at some point, yeah. I really missed you. I missed you too. Taylor reaches out to touch her hand. Louisa pulls away. I'm sorry, habit. No, I'm sorry, that... I shouldn't have. No, I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. I don't know how to be in a room with you when we're not together. No, it's strange, all right. Look, did you... How's your time at home been? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Well, I'm getting to spend some time with my sisters. That's really great. Yeah, yeah, it's been nice. You always said you wish you knew them better. I did, didn't I? And how's things with your mum? Uh, a little more complicated. I don't think the brother bomb helped. What? Oh, uh, when you came in yesterday, Nan just told us she had a son somewhere. Oh, shit. Yeah, shit. So when you showed up, it was just the cherry on top of a weird situation. No, I'm sure. Uh, makes sense now. That must have been a shock for everyone. Definitely. Taylor. Yeah? I need you to tell me why you came here. I mean, why you really came. What were you hoping would happen? You know I always wanted to see Ireland. Please, Taylor. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I guess... I don't know, I guess I was hoping for some form of closure or some understanding of what happened. You just left, Lou, with no explanation or discussion. I thought we were good. We were, for a while. I spent every day going over what happened, trying to work out where I went wrong. You've no idea how hard it's been living in that place and you not being there. I keep finding things that belong to you. Your hairbrush, books, clothes, the whole place still smells of you. It, it was like you died. I've literally been mourning for you. Only I think it's been worse than mourning because you chose to leave. I don't believe you left me like that just because it wasn't working. I know something happened, Lou. I just want to understand. That's why I'm here. And I know things can go back to the way they were, but I really need you to help me get over you. I know, I know I sound pathetic and I flew all this way just to try and get some sort of closure, but please, Lou, please give me something. Taylor, nothing happened. I just didn't want to be with you anymore. I don't believe you. We were talking about forever, Lou. I know you're not telling me something. I'm not. You want me to believe you just gave up? Fine. But I never will. You once told me I was the only person you'd been able to talk to about your dad. And about Maggie and the loneliness you felt when she remarried. The hating boarding school, but staying so you didn't have to see how happy they were. The feeling of losing your dad all over again when your granddad died. How being in your nan's was the only place you felt safe. I know it all, Lou. I know you. Damn it. I love you. I wish I didn't. Wish I could turn it all off. My family couldn't believe I was coming here. Thought after what you did, I would never want to see you again. Yet here I am asking you to do this one thing for me and tell me the truth. Please, please, Louisa, please just do this for me. What happened between us? I slept with someone. What? That night, I said I was at work, I was with someone. Who? Who doesn't matter. Well, how did you meet? Taylor, that doesn't matter. What matters is we spent the night together and in the morning, I couldn't face you. I was embarrassed and ashamed when I got home and I told you it was over. Packed as much as I could and went straight to the airport. 
but why didn't you tell me? We, we could have talked about it. <laughs> What's there to talk about? I would have liked the chance to discuss it, to decide together what was best for us. Are you saying you would have forgiven me? I love you, Louisa. I would have at least given us a chance to work it out. That's why I didn't tell you. You would have found a way to be fine with it, and I can't stand that about you. What? You're always too quick to forgive and move on when I make a mistake. Some things are unforgivable, Taylor, and I had to make that choice for both of us. You didn't have to. You wanted to. Taylor, if I told you and stayed, you would have never been able to trust me. You don't know that. You would have been questioning my every move, where I was going, who I was with. You haven't even asked me why I did it. Well, why did you do it? Because I was bored, okay? Because you were ready to play happy families and I wasn't. I thought they were things you wanted, though. We, we talked about baby names. You talked about baby names while I nodded along. Okay. So you don't want kids. Is that why you left? Oh my God, Taylor, no. It's not that I don't want kids. It's that I don't want them with you. Louisa gets up off the sofa and starts pacing. Taylor, you want the truth? Okay, here we go. Yes, that night I was with a guy, but it wasn't just him. There have been others, numerous. And the truth is, I just never told you. I don't believe you. All those things I told you about mom and dad, I've told them all. Guys love a wounded bird. They fly right into the nest, scoop them up and take them home. Louisa, stop. Yes, we were living together. I enjoyed your company, but that's all it ever was for me, Taylor. You were nothing more than a guy in my life and eventually I got bored of you, of them, of the States, really. If this was true, why did you leave in a rush like that? Why not just pack up calmly while I was in work? Because the guy I was with said he knew you. He said he was going to tell you and I just couldn't have been bothered going through all that. Look at you whimpering away like a wounded pup. If you really think about it, you knew something was wrong. Half the stuff I said about my family isn't even true. I don't recognize you. This person, this, this isn't my Lou. I never was your Lou. No, I'm beginning to see that now. Taylor gets up from the sofa and hands Louisa something from his pocket. You left this at our place. I thought it was important, but maybe it's just some sick joke. Part of your act. Tell me something before I leave and you never see me again. Was any of it real? None of it. You've done a real number on me, Louisa Mulligan. I really hope at some point in your life you find fulfillment. I actually feel sorry for you. Taylor walks towards the front door exit. Thank you. For what? Closure. Taylor exits. Louisa looks down into her hand and sees a small golden wedding ring. She hears the front door shut and then lets out a scream of anguish and collapses, dropping the wedding ring on the floor. Betty enters from the bedroom in a panic. What is it, love? What is it? What have I done? Louisa, Louisa. Betty's trying to get her off the floor and onto the sofa. It's not true, none of it. There, there, love, it's all right. I did it to protect him, I couldn't. They are now both sitting on the sofa and Betty is collecting Louisa up into her arms, rocking her back and forth. Shh, there, there. I've got you, I've got you. Louisa manages to catch her breath after a moment. What happened, love? I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't tell him. Oh, Louisa. Who would have crushed him, Nan? He wouldn't have understood. Louisa begins to cry again. Betty removes Louisa from her arms and stands up. I'm going to get you a copper. As Betty heads towards the exit for the kitchen, she sees the ring on the floor and picks it up. What's this, love? Dad's wedding ring. I must have left it there. He came all the way to give it to me. God, what have I done? Betty walks back to Louisa and hands it to her. Louisa, sweetheart, will I ring him and ask him to come back? No, Nan, it's, it's finished. Lou? I said no. Betty nods and exits from the kitchen. Louisa remains on the sofa with the ring in her hand. Dad? 
she lets out an anguished moan, blackout. The next day, Betty is sitting in her usual space in the living room, watching TV. Maggie enters in her uniform, looking exhausted. Well, seems okay. Very tired. What happened? I don't know, love. I don't know. It's like she has the symptoms of severe shock. Or broken heart. Taylor? You look exhausted. Yeah, haven't been sleeping. Why is that? Hmm, let me see. I spent the afternoon of your birthday calling people, telling them it was cancelled. Then I worked a 12 hour shift. David hasn't spoken to me in two days. I have a mysterious brother I never knew anything about. My daughter is distraught. Okay, okay, I get it. Art was stupid of me to try and get in touch with the lad. Really? You think? Maggie flops onto the sofa beside Betty. So what's going on with David? I don't know. When I got home, he packed a bag and said he was going to stay with his sister. Told me he needed time to think. I don't really get what he's so upset about. I mean, Louisa was just as rude to him as I was. Oh, come on, Maggie. I've taught you better than to be that naive. Okay, yes, fine. I could have stood up for him. What, dear? I can't stand it when he gets like that. All dopey and weak. I kind of hoped he'd stand his ground and say he was part of the family and stay. It's not that kind of person, dear. No, I know. It's one of the things that first drew me to him. So how are you going to fix it? <sighs> well, I need to talk to him. We have a few things we need to work out. It'll be okay though, Mum. I know I have a funny way of showing it, but I do love him. Mm -hmm. You heard me. I did. I was just surprised. Never heard you say that before. No. No, I suppose I don't say it enough. So what are we going to do about this situation? What situation would that be? Mum, please don't play dumb. What? Seriously? I just don't know why you took so long to tell us. What would you have, what would you have me say? Surprise everyone, I have a son somewhere. Well, you've grown up in a very different world to me. Did it ever occur to you that I kept the secret to protect you? How so? No, of course it didn't. How would that have... The whole street would have labelled me a whore. You'd have been kicked out of school if people knew I'd had a baby out of marriage. That seems a bit extreme. I think so. Well, it's true. You've no idea what it would have been like for us. So, what now? What do you mean? Well, are you really going to look for him? Well, of course I am. Okay. Is his dad still alive? Who's? The, my... Sean. Right. Is Sean's dad still alive? No. He was a good bit older than me. Never once wrote or asked about our child. Imagine. Did he? Of course he knew. We asked him would he leave his wife, but divorce was an even bigger scandal than sex. So, so no, he knew. Sean looked a lot like him, I thought. And how old was Sean when you last saw him? Oh, maybe a month. And why did you have to leave him there? Well, I couldn't raise him myself had no money and no one would have employed me. A single woman with a baby. I would tarnish their good name. Taking him home to live with Da was never an option. So really adoption was the best thing for him. Are you sure he was adopted? Of course I'm sure. Where else would he be? I don't know. Wasn't there a lot of deaths? What? I mean, didn't a lot of children die back then? Well, sure, birth was a lot more dangerous when I was a teenager than it is now. No, Mum, I mean in those places. Weren't they known for not giving proper care to the children? I didn't quite catch that, Maggie, but whatever it is, you're wrong. He's alive. Okay. Maggie's phone rings. She looks at it and sighs. David? Yeah. I think you should take it. Louise enters from the bedroom as the phone rings. She is pale and exhausted, uncertain where to sit. 
Maggie cancels the incoming call and moves up a little on the sofa to make room for her. Here. Louisa flops onto the sofa. Couldn't sleep. I can give you something if you're struggling. Anything to stop my mind. Maggie gets her bag and begins rooting. Any luck on the web? Yeah, I've sent a form to the of, of your name to the record office. Hopefully you'll hear something soon. No, you'd asked her. Oh no, she didn't. I offered. Right. We sit in silence altogether for a moment. Maggie hands Louisa a bottle of pills. She puts one in her hand. As she does this, she sees Louisa is wearing her dad's wedding ring around her neck. Where'd you get that? Oh, uh, you gave it to me. Yeah? yeah? No, I remember. I just hadn't seen it for a long time. Maggie's phone rings again. You gonna answer that? No. David? I'm getting serious. Deja vu. I wonder when you two will realise just how alike you are. Maggie and Louisa look at Betty. Will we watch some Poirot? Louisa smiles and heads to the kitchen. She re-enters moments later with a glass of water and David in tow. David was at the door. David. What can we do for you, David? Maggie, I'd like to talk to you, please. David, it's not the time. Well, I've been trying to call you. Uh, it's okay, I was feeling a bit tired anyway. Nan, maybe you can watch Poro, Poro in your bedroom. What? I can put it on in your room. Why would I want that? I have a perfectly good TV here. Uh, I think David and Maggie want to. No, it's fine, Mum. Stay where you are. Please, Maggie. I really need to talk to you. You are, David, sure. I can watch Poirot in my own room. No bother. Louisa helps Betty get up and they both leave the room towards the bedrooms. Where are the girls? They're fine. They're with my sister. They told me to find you here. Yeah, well, Louisa wasn't feeling well. Maggie, please just let me talk for a second. I need to say something. Okay. I would have preferred to have this conversation at home. Well, you could have come home, David. I mean, you didn't need to leave like that. Maggie, please. Let me finish. Sorry. I came here to tell you that I'm going to tell Louisa I wanted to adopt her. Keep your voice down. No, no, I won't. I've spent 10 years wondering what I did to be hated by her and I finally realized I did nothing. Let's not. No, Maggie, this is my time to talk. For once, just please shut up and listen to me. In Louise's mind, I literally did nothing because she doesn't know that I wanted to adopt her. Does she? David, please. Maggie, I'm going to ask you one more time. Does Louisa know? No. Because you never told her? Yes. And you've been lying to me about it this entire time? Yes. You are unbelievable. Why, Maggie? What did I do to make you hate me this much? David, calm down. No, Maggie, I will not calm down. You have lied to me and your daughter for years. This has nothing to do with Lou. This is everything to do with her. I wanted to be a family. I wanted to protect her and love her. And instead, instead, you turned me into a villain. I can't get my head around the idea that for years, she's thought of me as this, this evil guy who stole her mum and kept her sisters away from her, when what I wanted was the exact opposite. And I was way, way too scared to talk to her about it directly because you were always in my mind saying, leave it with me, David. Let me talk to her, David. I've been such a fool. I just can't understand why. Why, Maggie? What did I do to deserve this, this narrative? Was it just that you didn't want me to replace Tom? No one would ever replace Tom. I didn't want to. Yes, you did. You wanted to swoop in and be the hero that plucked the teenager from her grief and depression because her mum couldn't. You wanted to love her and make her laugh and help her get her life back, something I couldn't do. How do you think that made me feel? I asked you though, 
We talked about it before till it was born. You sat right there and said you thought it was a great idea. I said a lot back then. I'm going to tell her. David begins to walk towards the bedrooms. Maggie jumps up and grabs his arm. David, no. Let go of me, please. Please, David, listen to me. You've had your chance to say what you wanted. You've had years of chances. I know you're angry and you have every right to be. And I should have told you about it rather than just pretending and let this escalate. But if you tell her now, it'll ruin everything. It has ruined everything. She hates me. She thinks I purposefully isolated her from her mum and her sisters. No, no, it'll ruin everything with me, with my relationship with her. Look, this afternoon, for the first time ever, she called me and asked me to come over. She let me sit on the bed with her while she cried. She let me comfort her. I think the last time I held her like that was when she was a child. Tom took my chance of being a good mother from me. He shone so bright that I never stood a chance. And you, you were so excited to have Tilly. I could see it in your eyes. You'd be just as good a dad as Tom had been. I didn't want you to take Lou from me. I couldn't stand it. You have to understand that I spent the first 13 years of motherhood jealous of my child's relationship with my partner. I couldn't do that again. I didn't tell her. I thought if she goes to boarding school and only visited on holidays, that we could start our new life and family and, and still have her connected to it, but not, not taking it over. I really did plan on telling her when she was 18. And I thought by then she'd be old enough to understand that I loved her just as much as her dad had, just showed it in a different way. But off she went to the States and somehow this, small thing of me not telling her turned into this idea that you didn't want her in our lives. You took advantage of me, Maggie. No, it's not like that. That's exactly what it's like. You knew I would never talk to her without your blessing. You knew how desperate I was for her to accept me and you did everything you could to make sure that didn't happen. Made me the bad guy, so you looked like the good one. And then, when she stood there and said, stay out of it, David, you're not family. You did nothing. You asked me to leave. Do you have any idea how humiliating that was? How hard that was for our daughters to hear? I'm a nice guy. I'm the guy who'll run himself to the ground for other people. I've given you everything you've asked of me. And I asked you to do one thing, one thing, Maggie. I've got to tell her. David begins to walk to the bedrooms. Look, I know that I'm difficult and stubborn, okay? I know you're an extraordinary father and would have been to Lou had I given you both the chance. And, and you've given me everything, everything I wanted. And I know I ask a lot of you and I find it easier to pick a fight with you than I do to tell you how I feel because I know what it's like to lose someone you love. Damn it, David, there's, there's so much I should say to you and I never do, but please listen to me. I'm terrified that if you tell her now, after all these years and whatever she's been through in the past few months, I don't know if she could take it. What do you mean? Something happened between her and the American. Is she all right? She will be in time. So what would you have me do? Give me time. I'd really like to keep working on my relationship with her. And then hopefully through that, we can all find our way. So never tell her. Is that what you're saying? David, I know you'll never forgive me for not telling her when she was younger. And I accept that. But so much time has passed now. What if telling her only causes more damage? Well, we won't know that until she knows. I just don't think I can trust you, Maggie. I'm I want to fix things between me and her. The problem I have is that I know you didn't keep this from Lou to protect her. You did it to protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so true. David, I don't know where I'd be if you hadn't come into my life. I don't think I'd have ever found my way through the grief. You, you pick me up gave me a reason to live again. 
and I know I've really messed up here and I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. She reaches out for his hands. Please. I'm... I love you. David lets out a sigh and walks towards her. Where does this leave us, Maggie? I'll follow your lead. David thinks for a moment, then finally sits down beside Maggie. We'll give her some time to see how she's doing. If she's having a hard time, I certainly don't want to make it worse. And when she's ready, we can start again and put in a joint effort to make things better. But you have to promise me, Maggie, you'll be on my side. Otherwise, I'll go in there right now and tell her everything. I do. I, I absolutely can do that. No more secrets, Maggie. Our relationship can't take it. Nope. No more. I promise. Okay. She leans into him. After some time, he puts his arm around her. Any news in the Sean situation? Louise is looking into it. And how do you feel about it? Honestly, I don't know. And she really called you earlier? Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Said she needed her mum. <laughs> That's great. They sit there for a little while longer. I love you too. Blackout. Two weeks later, Betty and Louisa are sitting in the living room. Louisa is on her laptop and Betty is reading her book. That is no good. What? What? What's no good, Nan? Oh, the forensics. I think I'll have to give it a rest. I've been on the same chapter for three weeks. I think I'll just have to stick to my original idea. Which was what? Private detective, like Hercule Poirot. The one and only. <laughs> what about South America? Oh no, too clammy. Canada? Too cold. Asia? But too foreign. Nan? What? Never mind. You want an English-speaking country, that's a certain. Well, it won't matter so much because I'm not going to be working, just travelling. Well, you want somewhere you can eat decent food. What? Asian food is amazing. Nonsense. Sure, how can rice even be a food? It's a tiny bit of white nothingness, but it always gets stuck in my teeth. Much better to stick to normal food. Whatever you say, Nan. Yes, please, Louise. A cup of tea would be great. Louisa puts down her laptop and heads towards the kitchen. The phone rings as she leaves and she answers. Hello. Oh, hi, Marjorie. Yeah, she's here. One sec. Who is it? Marjorie. Oh, for goodness sake, I'm not in the mood for nonsensical gossip. Will I tell you you're busy? No, no, give it to me. Louisa hands over the phone. Betty watches her as she exits to the kitchen. Marge, how are you? Now tell me all. Ha! I knew she'd never get enough votes. Poor old Joan. And what did the father tell them about me? Are you having a laugh? Sure, it was not. I quit. The first person ever to quit midterm too. Oh, yeah. And is that what they all said? Sure, she's nothing but a gossip, Marjorie. There's nothing better to be doing than sitting on a throne all day and chatting nonsense. You'd never find me doing that. No, I know. Just what I said. Yeah. Oh, she did sound perky, didn't she? Well, since that boy left, she's slowly been more like herself. I know. She's on the little box thing, you know, the web. Yeah. She's swimming here, looking up where she's going to go. Decided she'd travel for a bit, do some healing, she said. Oh, no, I don't think she meant it like that. I'll ask her if she's going to bring us back some. <laughs> Good idea, Marge. Absolutely. Louisa re-enters with the tea and a letter in her hand. During the rest of Betty's conversation, she puts down the tea and takes a seat on the sofa. OK, listen, Marge, I'm about to have me tea, so I'll leave you now. Yeah, I know. Um. Oh, well, well. Thanks a mill for telling me. Okay, yeah, okay, Marge. I'll see you at bridge tomorrow. Great. Thanks then. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Okay. God bless. Bye. 
Bye. Betty puts the phone down and picks up her tea. Thanks, love. Poirot. Did you open this letter, Nan? Hmm? This letter was in the kitchen. When did it arrive? Oh, yeah. Came this morning. Did you open it? No. No, why would I? Sure it has your name on it. It's from the record office. Oh. Do you want me to open it? I don't know. I suppose you'd better. Do you want to do it? No, look. No. Louisa sets down her tea and opens the letter. She reads slowly. Oh, for goodness sake, child, what does it say? Sorry, there's a lot. Betty reaches over and takes the letter from her hand. Give it to you. Nan. Betty begins to read the letter. Nan, ha hang on. I don't understand what it's saying. Nan. What does this mean? C-O-D unknown. Louisa is reading the letter over Betty's shoulder. Nan, how old was Sean when you last saw him? Well, let me stay with him for about a month. If a dad could pay for me to leave, so I had to. They said he was going to be adopted. Louisa moves to be closer to Betty. This says he died when he was three months old. Died? That's what it's saying. Oh, no, that's not right. He didn't die. He was adopted. But the letter says... Well, the letter is wrong, Louise. Betty throws the letter away from her. Louise picks it up and reads. It says the cause of death is unknown or not recorded. Because he isn't dead. Nan, the dates match up. They've sent the birth certificate. Look, that's your signature, isn't it? He's, he's dead. I'm so sorry. He died there in that awful place. That's not right. It's not fair, Louisa. It's not fair. It's okay, Nan. It's okay. Oh, no. He was just a baby. Why didn't I know? Why did no one tell me? I don't know. I spent every day of my life thinking about him, wondering where he was and if he was okay. Why didn't they tell me? I don't know, Nan. I'm so, I'm so, so sorry. He was a tiny little thing. Born almost a month early, but with a great mop of hair on him. They said for sure he'd be one of the ones to get adopted and have a good home. But I didn't know. Why couldn't I keep him? They were awful places. It, it should never have happened. It's my fault. No, Nan. I kept it quiet. I let them take him. What more could you have done? Demand to see him. Demand to get him out. But I had to keep him quiet. He had to be a secret. Secrets. They're like poison. You did what you thought was best. Best for who? Pretending he didn't exist made my life easier, but it ended his. My Sean. Louisa takes Betty's hands and holds them. It's like I'm losing them all over again. You had to keep them secret, Nan. You can't blame yourself for that. Your life would have been so hard if people knew about him. I know it was a burden to keep it to yourself for all these years, but you can't blame yourself. Betty looks at Louisa as if she's seeing her for the first time. You have your father's eyes. I'll have to tell Maggie. Oh, leave it, Nan. I, I'll do that. Where is he? Where is he buried? Did the letter say? How? Oh, how could he be dead? How could I not know? I'm his ma'am. It's not your fault. But I should have known. I should have sensed it. Oh, the poor baby. I must have been a terrible ma'am. That's absolutely not true, Nan. You're a wonderful woman with a big heart. I am a terrible ma'am. And now look at Maggie. What about her? Louisa, you don't have to pretend with me. I know you two don't get on. Oh, well, we've surprisingly had a good few weeks. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's like she's really trying to make an effort for once. David, too, actually. So, no, Nan, you didn't ruin her because you are a good mom. You okay, Nan? What? Are you okay? Yes. Yes, I'm I'm all right, love. I, I was thinking, just thinking. About Sean. <sighs> yes. Do you wish that you'd looked for him sooner? That's what I was just thinking. But deep down. Perhaps I always knew. And that's why I didn't look for him. Oh, 
always wondered why he hadn't come looking for me. Makes sense now. He would have found me if he'd been able, I'm sure of it. You know, I pictured this entire life for him. Yeah. He had a good family and a great job and three dogs and a villa in France. He was so, so happy. And I knew that letting him go had been the best decision I ever made. No. I should have found a way to take him with me. Nan, we can find out what happened to him. Maybe it was something that would have happened even if you had taken him. No, no. He's been at peace for so long. I think it best we leave him. I'll find out where he's buried for you. I would like that very much. Thank you. He was lucky to have you, Nan. Oh, I was lucky to have him. If it weren't for Sean, I would never have come to Dublin and met your granda. Then there'd never have been you. Everything happens for a reason. Louisa looks at Grandad's chair. Do you wish that you'd told him? What? About Sean. Oh, I often wondered how he would have reacted, but no, I, I, I don't regret it. Why not? I guess I was scared that telling him would change how he felt about me. I decided that not telling him took away any possibility of him hating me. I wouldn't have managed watching him fall out of love with me. Nan, he was such a good man, I'm sure he never would have hated you. Your tailor seemed a good man also. I think you and I are more alike than we know. Yes. They sit together. Betty holds Louisa's hand and raises her cup of tea. To Sean. To Sean. They clink their teacups. After a while, Louisa gets up and moves to the piano. She begins to play as time goes by from Casablanca. You must remember this. A kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. As time goes by. Louisa gets up from the piano and picks up her cup of tea. She is moving towards Betty to sit on the sofa. Will you pop on, Poirot? Louisa turns on the TV and starts to, to walk back towards the sofa. You're not going to sit in your granddad's chair? Louisa looks at Betty. They share a smile. Louisa sits in Grandad's chair. The pair hold hands and watch the TV, interacting with the action, calling out Poirot and quoting bits. As time goes by, plays overhead. Blackout. That's the end of the play. Well done, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to be back in 10 minutes for our Q&A, so about 21 minutes past nine. If you've got any thoughts or comments, you can start popping those into the chat now. Um, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks very much.
Mm-hmm. 